Hello everyone, welcome again to our Wednesday Bricks Artist Talk series. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Um, I'm just going to wait a couple of moments to see if anyone else is going to join. I'm in a torrential hailstorm. Mental, isn't it? It's, just, it's quite nice this morning. You've got a torrential rainstorm where you are, a hailstorm. Yeah. It's I really have got huge hailstones. Wow. Over Stroud Way. <laughs> um, okay, I think we will start. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Matthew, Matthew Roy Arnold today, who's going to be talking for about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, just to let you know, we are recording this talk um, and we'll be sharing these later on this year um, on our website. So I'll briefly introduce Matthew and then hand over to him and then we'll have uh, questions and answers. Um, well, possibly at the end, but I think, Matt, you're quite interested in people um, asking questions as we go along as well, aren't you? Oh, sorry, I, I've, I've muted. I muted you earlier. Can you unmute? <laughs> there you go. Good. Yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah, it'll be good if people could join in with questions because uh, I, I might just stop and waffle on about something. So and I might leave something out. So, That's why we're here to hear uh, you waffle on. <laughs> yeah, but it might be completely abstract. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, okay. So I'll just introduce Matt. So, in a world of cloning, accessible mass manufacture, and virtual reality, mankind is approaching the fulfilment of its ancient desire to attain the power of creation, to rival and even overcome the gods which we've feared for so long. However. The greater our power over nature grows, perhaps the more apparent our flaws become. Our mastery of technology has progressed at astonishing speed, yet has our philosophical and spiritual understanding of reality undergone the same transformative advancement. In this talk, Matthew Roy Arnold will present recent light and sculptural interventions to reflect our landscape and its infinite possibilities. Um, so, I think if um, if you want to ask a question um, as we go along, maybe just try and jump in because Matt might not be able to see your face if you're waving at him. Um, can, if you can try and stay muted unless you've got um, a question, that would be fantastic. OK, over to you. Right. OK, um, I'm just going to share my screen and uh, screen share. Hopefully I'll get this all right. screen there we go hopefully you can see that oh yeah it gives me pictures of you guys on the right so there we go oh you've gone um i won't know if you've waved or anything so hopefully you could just unmute yourself and then say something if you're interested uh these so i've been making rock landscapes for probably about five years now and um, and it started off with create um getting rocks just picking them up from random places and um uh casting them out and i think this was i think this was inspired by the idea of like a multi uh multiverse uh, multi-universe theory that was kind of around like um uh, 2012 that was I found quite interesting so I carried on and I, th I, I took molds of these rocks and then pulled them into different shapes trying to twist them and stuff like that pulled the the silicon and the latex molds trying to twist them and then um, uh, I don't think that actually went anywhere I think I just had problems with that and I thought well I'll just cast them out and um, make and alter them myself so this is an exhibition I had um, 
uh, I think this one, yeah, this one's the first one. It's called Recursions, and it was in London. And it's um, these three pieces. Are the, I think there were seven in the exhibition, and these three were like the first three. Uh, okay, but so on this image here, the the um, you've got the original rock in the top middle. Uh, I've got the arrow on it. It's there. That's the original rock, and then I've done a cast of it. Uh, the cast, I think these ones are done in plaster and then they've been airbrushed um, and then it's kind of, I've done a faint airbrushing around it and then altered them a bit more as they go around. These works, uh, they're mounted on a piece of glass and they've got some circuitry in them. So what, what there is, is there's, if you can see, if you, you can see from my arrow, that's, that's a positive and then the one around that side there is a negative, the wire there that's structurally holding the piece together and the LEDs up, uh, are, um, the power's running through them. And in the background, I actually collaborate with my brother who does um, some of the electronics and uh, some of the works. But this one was uh, like a direct collaboration where he, I'll, I'll find a better picture of it, but he drew on circuit boards and got them printed off. So he's used this, um, this Pentagon theme here that came out pretty much at random due to them being 10 rocks and then halving that, that they fit into each of these gaps around the edge here, that there's, um, ends up as a pentagon. So he copied that into the, um, into the circuit board design there and drew patterns on the circuit board like a, like a heat sink. Um, so this is a, at normal daylight. Uh, there's a sensor at the bottom there, which uh, senses movement and there is a light sensor hidden away somewhere. I can't see it up there. Uh, this is another one of them. So as they go around, there's the original rock there. And as the cast, I've altered them. There's some drawings on these ones. So the drawings kind of, I think they re represent some part of the rock or something along them lines. And they've changed. So basically they're, it's changing as though that like, uh, like alternate spaces. I'm kind of interested in alternate spaces and um, how we play, we create uh, alternate spaces in online worlds. Uh, this is what happens when the lights turn out. It turns itself on and it shows a white, these white LEDs that are in between the two structures there. And then it casts a nice big shadow on the wall. And then if you move around, it will trigger the infrared sensor, which should it'll fade from the white light to the UV light, showing invisible, which you couldn't see previously, invisible UV paintings on them. Uh, that's, oh, there you can see the, the drawing on the circuit board that my brother did uh, in the middle there. And um, we collaborate on quite a lot of works. Uh, previously, we had a, an exhibition of um, like interactive sculptures that that lit up and did all sorts of things. But well, that's that's a different talk. And this is it in the light mode, the white mode. And again, so these are kind of the shadows that you get on the wall from it. And that's it in the UV mode. And here again. So these, this is the first one. Um, these works, the kind of, sorry, I've got a cat here drinking my tea. Um, these works are kind of inspired by like, um, yeah, the alter, oh, that's the cat. There we go. These works were kind of um, inspired by these ideas of multi-universes and how, how um, there's a possibility of that happening in, in today. So I kind of set up like drawings and stuff like that to do with, these are all sketches to do with um, ideas. This, these ones here, like I've got little speakers on, I don't know if you can see that very well, but these are all just little sketches that I do to do, get the ideas and then I make something completely different. Um, after that exhibition, I ended up uh, building a workshop in my garden because I was making lots of mess with cutting up rocks 
and making too much noise in the normal white cube studio space. So I ended up, um, well, I ended up buying a house with my brother and I built a workshop in the garden. That's the workshop. Um, so there was a, I had a bit of a break from making so much work and ex exhibiting until this year. Um, me and my brother had an exhibition here. Uh, uh, it was at Cos Art Contemporary. And uh, this one's called Soul, this exhibition. This, um, this work here, these are all like hanging rocks in the middle of a dark space. So um, what I wanted to do with this one is it was kind of themed more around um, environment, like I would say the environmental side, like not strictly the like how bad and good the environment is, but it's more like affecting it, just the fact of affecting the, the environment. Um, so what I did was I took the rocks and then I cut into them and um, altered the rocks. So if you look at this one here, it's this is a just a piece of rock from it was actually from the garden just behind the workshop, and um, the uh, I took that uh, drilled into it and made put some steel cable on it, and then cut into the rock and altered it. So I kind of liked the feeling of losing what once was, and um, so this has got like a UV light on one side and some white LEDs there. I soldered up a little circuit that basically um, just turns itself on at night. And all the, the works are quite minimal, so that in a way that they, you see all the, the gubbins that puts it all together. So the, the circuitry here, you can see still, like with the recursion ones at the start I showed, that they have uh, enameled wire as the negative wrapping around. Might be, Easier to see in another image. Nope. Can I ask that? What um, you can do? You, do you use? Do you have to choose a specific type of stone to work with? Oh no, I've learned that the hard way. Like I've um, I've picked up some rocks. Like I've gone all the way up Snowdon, picked up some rocks, come down with it, and then I've took it all the way home, and then I've uh, drilled into it and it's fallen apart. So not them ones. I kind of know now which ones look like. It's usually the, the the kind of the slaty ones that I kind of start to drill into and they start falling apart. Right. But, and I base it on like, I mean, you're supposed to hit it with a hammer and it dings or it doesn't ding or thuds if there's a crack in it. So what is, I, is it meant to not ding? Well, I think I think uh, if it dings, it's, it's probably solid. Uh, and if it thuds, I think there's probably like an echo in it. But I don't use rocks like that anyway. I think, I mean, this probably would ding a little bit because it looks very solid. If you, you, I can kind of tell by the look of it, I think you probably could. You can see also big cracks in them usually. So this one's quite solid, this one. Um, so drilling into this one would be be fine. But you, sometimes you get like uh, like strata lines in it. I think it's the right word. I know nothing about rocks, which is quite funny. <laughs> like uh, I, just, I just see some that I like and then just work and alter them. And yeah, I just... Uh, yeah, I don't know too much about the structure of them or had any formal training in carving them or anything like that. I just use diamond bits and polish, polishing pads and wet grinders and stuff like that. Do they ever have fossils in? Yeah, yeah, they do actually, which is, uh, I think there's one on here that does have, um, I'd say, it. Look, I think it's like fossilised tree bits. I couldn't figure it out actually. But I find, yeah, it's quite, you find them in there quite often. Like, well, shells quite a lot of shells are in rocks uh i haven't found a dinosaur or anything like that nothing <laughs> that interesting <laughs> um yeah so these these ones this one here i decided to um cut into this so if you look closely at it the um the engravings at the bottom there, I just started, I kind of didn't really want to have an idea what I wanted to do. So I just started doing around here, it looks a little bit like, uh, I suppose it looks like African tribal kind of carvings. It reminds me of the cave paintings that you get and, and stuff like that. And then it goes a little bit more uniformed and as, as it goes out and on the flat surface, I did it as very used rulers and um, stuff to cut the, cut the lines very straight. 
And I kind of like that kind of uniformed. I, I kind of like that in the artwork. I have a little bit of a stress between uniformed pieces of artwork and uh, like expressive pieces. So the idea of painting a rock to look exactly like the original is very uniformed, but could still be quite a talent. But they also you can have like expressive bits, which is quite creative. And I kind of like that balance that you get with the work. And I suppose the whole thing is about formulating like a balance with trying to create something and alter something so it looks right. I suppose everybody gets that with their artwork, but looks right. But having this as a represent, well, not a representation, but having this as an actual landscape for us altering our own landscape, we might want to find a, some sort of uniform balance between nature and humans, I guess. So yeah, that's another angle from that same rock. And this is, um, uh, so the, before I did the repeating worlds kind of idea with other, the ideas behind the parallel universes and alternative spaces is um, uh, I used like casting, but this time I didn't, I didn't really want to do that again or do it as much. So uh, I decided to get some, cut some glass discs out and um, put some, the one way glass mirror in it. So you get like a reflective, uh, if you can see in here, you get like a reflect, an infinity reflective thing within the glass. So on the side here, uh, this is like copper, uh, copper foil. And then there's the positive around that side there and the negative around that side. And then that's what powers these LEDs in the middle which shine onto the rock, which makes it brighter in the middle to then reflect all the way down the middle. So these are like floating works that you see in the space. Um, that's the video so you can actually see what I'm on about. There you go. And that is someone looking at one. So this one, this one is the one that you mentioned, Jessica, that we're, um, there's fossils in the middle of that. So this has the same positive and negative either side. I've altered the work. And um, uh, that's it from a different angle. Uh, and yeah, so this area here is there's some sort of little fossil things in it. And I don't know what that is. It looks pretty organic. So I think it's some sort of tree branches or I don't know, bamboo. I, I have no idea. But yeah, they, they look, they go through it. So I'm not sure what it is. But yeah, I keep on finding bits and bobs on there. And this rock was quite fresh, actually. So I leave, left, leave it in my garden for a bit. And because you lose some colours and all sorts of stuff when you, when you take it out. I had some flint the other day that absolutely went so dull. It was, it doesn't look nearly as good as it did to start off with. What, so, is, what, makes, it, what makes it dull? Is it the um, weather? Yeah, so I think I got it from quite a damp environment. So I think I got it from the, the coast in Dover and um, it had some really beautiful colours on it. And I think it was kind of like bits of pink and all sorts of stuff on it. And I took a photograph of it at the time. So I think what I might do is I've cast that one out. I think I might paint it how it previously was and then have uh, an example how it is now with the actual real rock and then also do maybe do an oversaturated version of what it once was if you get what i mean so at one point when i found it it was this lovely color and then it's actually dulled and been altered and changed but that one you can just see there there's some moss on the end there mm. um these are these little boxes that i made for the exhibition so these are um uh like pyramids that that come that are set on a mirror at the back and this one's like got full of UV lights inside. Um, oh yeah, so I, I've been using the UV lights. So especially like the invisible one on the first recursions that I showed that they kind of like it as like an alternative space. So it's something that like our eyes, our spectrum of our eyes, we, we can't like the invisible stuff, we can't see. And then the UV makes it come out. And it's it reminds me of like the internet exists all the way all around us and in our in our room we run things off like wi-fi and that's everywhere and lots of things like alternative spaces like that, that we cannot witness which still make our environment 
Whereas if you put the UV, it's kind of like it's all integrated and then it pops out sometimes and doesn't, which I quite like. So I kind of like playing around with that and it looks good as well. Um, so that's three of these little light boxes and this uh, they cast quite nice little shadows on the wall. I try and make the works quite aesthetic because I put them up in my house generally. I've got lots of them around the house at the moment. And I quite like living with them. So these also have sensors on, so they turn themselves on when it's dark. Um, and I kind of like the idea of living with them because then I can put them up and then decide if it's really annoying me, I can change it. So um, this is another one which is, so that previous one was with white LEDs and that one's half white and then the right hand side is half um, UV and the, I think it's been on the, the UV side, it's been polished up the rock there and the left quite natural on the left hand side. Yeah, and that's the natural side there. And yeah, I've done engravings on it and little patterns, look like little drawings and diagrams. I'm not sure what of, probably was thinking something at the time. And then after that show, I made this piece over the summer and this one is that same place where I found that previous flint from. Um, this is a piece of flint from uh, Dover. And um, I cast the rock out and this one I've just airbrushed it in to look like uh, just like a pretty saturated sunset. Uh, with some nice shiny paint. So it's quite aesthetic, this one. The either side of this one, uh, so if you look at the metalwork, uh, that side, the right hand side is... I can't tell on here, but it's either the positive and negative, and it's separated or it's joined together by the rock, rocks in the middle. And um, this one um, I've put on my wall of the house on that, like the west wall, and it basically has an orange light. So I put that in, and it basically is like a like a sunset. So that I was I was looking at the sensors, how they when the sensors turn the lights on, they um, they sense like a gradual fade and then the light turns on gradually. It's not like an on off thing. So when they turn on gradually, it, it gradually appears this kind of sunset as it gets darker in the front room of my house. So it's quite a nice, I quite like that, how it kind of, it, it like due to our own environment, I can't see the sunset where my house is. So it, it kind of replaces it with like an artificial one. Um, and this is the middle room of my house, which has ended up being a uh, place of making mess and electronic stuff, which I'm trying to do, which I'm not that good at. I can do the components and soldering and stuff like that, but when it comes to um, programming, I haven't quite got the gist of that yet. So I'm learning how to program. This is like a halo that I made. Um, learning how to program the lights and different circuits. And this is a pe recent piece of work that I'm working on uh, because I'm trying to incorporate um, programming chips to alter the lights, but also I'm going to incorporate sound. So this um, left side is a speaker. Um, uh, so well, it's going to be a speaker. It's not finished this piece and it's just primed this left side. So it's a bit of welded up steel. And I've done a mold of this right hand, the rock on the right hand side, which is from Snowden, this one. Um, I've done a mold of that and it's going to, I'm making my own speakers out of magnets and enameled wire. And I want to work, well, from some of my previous exhibitions that I've done, I've worked with composers. So I kind of want to work with uh, musicians and uh, like composers to make sounds for the works. Um, uh, so that's basically the next move for these landscapes is incorporating some sort of atmospheric soundscape to them and um, seeing how that works. And that's the end of the slides. I don't know what time it is. I'm not very good at doing this escape. 24 minutes. That's not too bad. <laughs> Thank you. That is oh, oh, sorry. I was meant to mention the exhibition, but I'll be able to put that in in a bit. I was just going to say, um, like collaboration seems a really important aspect of your of your work. Do you, 
like how how do you kind of um manage that do you sort of come up with ideas together or is it always you approaching someone to work with them um well I work with my brother quite a lot so we have quite uh we have similar sets of ideas so that's quite helpful so I pick people I don't I'm not sure if I'm good at collaborating with people that do the same sort of thing uh like physically making because I, I I don't know but I would just get annoyed that I wouldn't agree with them so I think if I when I work with my brother he does um he does the the robotics and he he um I think he's on here actually so I'm not saying anything too bad <laughs> he um so he has his own ideas to do with um uh the way he uh designs the robotics he wants them to be quite honest and uh and I do the similar sort of thing with the artwork I try not to hide too much away the idea of making this work quite abstract uh this is quite important in the work that I don't make any visuals representing anything else so it's all abstract work that exists this was one of the main concepts from one of our earlier exhibitions that's probably why I didn't mention it but the works are meant to be really in front of you and just only exist in front of you so using the real rocks and uh, having that in front of you is very important so you don't come to see a piece of work and then although you do get lost in like an imagination you don't it's not trying to be something else which i'm not really keen on in artwork well my work my practice i don't like i wouldn't like to make a sculpture of a horse to represent a horse that doesn't isn't there it's probably half the size of a horse so things like that i'm not i kind of uh, shout, uh, stay away from so the, so the rock exists as a landscape itself rather than being a stand-in for a landscape yeah, yeah it's not I don't, yeah it's quite a difficult one to describe I, I i like the rocks to be something in its own right like uh, the manifest i had an exhibition we called it manifestations and this is the one that i keep mentioning but it was done before the recursions one where it's all about manifesting something in its space and having an existence and it looks very sci-fi and very it's very abstract and these objects exist in their own right but I find that the things that exist in their own right are very interesting like people and plants like I mean no nobody really represents anyone else they well they shouldn't really but they do like in, as a job but <laughs> I'm saying that you the interesting thing is that the objects in front of you and not been replaced by an idea or something and has no preconceptions of something else so you I try not to say that this is that or this is a, a landscape of this or this is so when saying this is environmental work I don't mean that it's saying we shouldn't like destroy our environment it's a sort of thing that i am altering these rocks and they're becoming this form and people can think what they want but that's what's in front of you and some are altered more than others and that's what the rock is and it doesn't it's not like do this do that so it's not creating an environment for a moment in time um creating them yeah yeah i would say yeah it's it is it's it is its own entity and they are floating in a in a gallery space uh, as their own in their own right um and people you you probably will end up thinking of like oh rocks floating in space and different worlds and things like that but the the actual thing is that it's it's like when you see abstract work uh, the, with the manifestations one, they looked very alien-like and everyone thought they were alien. Like they were like, oh, it looks like this. So it's like, and it's only because you don't recognize it, it's alien. It's it's probably more real than, than an image of something else because it's something in its own right. Like it's not alien. It's, it's what it is. It's a piece of work in the space. It's not anything else. Hmm. Um, Matt, do you want to stop sharing your screen and then we can oh, yeah. see um, 
see everyone and see if anyone has got any questions. Uh, yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions that they wanted to ask? Ellie? Um, oh, sorry, my microphone's terrible. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Um, thank you for that. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Um, I wanted to ask a bit more about your relationship to the works as they become part of your domestic space. Um, you talked a bit about the, the kind of sunset um, colours and the, um, the artwork, but yeah, could you talk a bit more about that and how that changes? And then if that then influences future works as well. Yeah, so, um, uh, so the earlier exhibition, the one with the manifestations, one that I mentioned, which are their sound sculptures with lights in, and they're quite, um, they haven't got rocks in them basically. And quite organic shapes. Um, the, the, the soundscapes in them, they're, they're not, they're very, I quite like using aesthetics within things. So using form, formulaic things. So making something that is not too jarring or making something that doesn't so I have them in my house, actually, just one of them behind me there. I don't know if you can see it, but that has like a little breathing mechanism and lights up. It seems it doesn't breathe, but it kind of lights up and down. And as you get closer to it, it goes into a, a shivering state. Um, that has, um, if I put that on, I, I don't get fed up of it, really. Um, we had an exhibition that was on for, I don't know, it must have been like eight hours a day. Um, this was a while back, this is like 2013 or 14, but, and um, the sounds weren't too jarring. They weren't too, it wasn't like a loop of a, a, a video or something like that. And I try and make it, there was like three albums installed and in, into the work that as you approached it, it got more intense or, but that's only as a one-off as you get closer to it. So it's quite, they were quite atmospheric sounds and the briefs that we kind of gave ourselves were like, you make something that's kind of, when working with the composer, he, he kind of made uh, like soundscapes instead of um, tracks and stuff like that. So um, other oh, composer was called Daniel Chocoloni, by the way. So, um, and he made like soundscapes for the work and um, they didn't, they didn't really jar and put you off. So making the other works, the light sculptures, we I put the recursions up in the house and they make, the, the thing I really like about them is you come down at night and they've turned, them also, or they've turned themselves on and you walk past them and they change. Um, although a few things that I have found with them is the recursion ones is a, with UV has um, the fluorescence in UV. Uh, they, they wear out after time. So this is like a five-year-old uh, exhibition uh, works and I can tell that the UV's faded after a little bit. So um, I suppose that happens with all UV and glow in the dark paints, I think, because of the fluoros in it. But then, yeah, then turn themselves on at night. Uh, the different works in the house is it's quite nice and atmospheric. And I quite like that meditation time because in gallery spaces, I don't just sit there and ponder in my own mind. I'm always aware of being stood in a gallery space and I find that quite, um, you're not 100% relaxed, I guess. I don't know how other people feel in the space. Does that help? Yeah, that was really interesting. Thanks. Anyone else have any questions that they want to put to Matthew? I have a question about multiverses. Yeah. <laughs> um, like what, what is it about the theory of the multiverse that interests you and leading on from that, thinking about alternate realities? Have you ever been um, tempted to work with VR or AR technologies? Um, the um... Uh, so to start off with the, the multiverse thing is uh, it was just a theory, the theory that I kind of uh, I think it came about in like around 2010 or somewhere around there. And I found it the I mean, quite a lot of people were 
going on board with it on scientists thinking like Elon Musk was always like, oh, there's a, there's a very good chance we're in the multiverse. And the, the, if you break, if you go through the ideas of it, I kind of break it down and I think, well, there probably is a good chance. And I kind of, and I always think it's a chance. I don't say it is or it isn't, but there's things like other things that I'm like, oh, well, that's a coincidence or this is that, how we gather so much information at the moment and uh, we live at this time. And if you progress and you think into the future, the possibilities you could, put, could get in the future. And also I, I like adding ideas of like, well, the ideas of bringing the ideas of a God into it is quite nice. It kind of, I quite like it as a, instead of thinking totally like, oh, there is nothing and uh, we don't know what's going on. You can actually build up a thought process where you're like, well, someone could be controlling this, this universe in a way, like a, com like a simulation is that it could be created. And I like the ideas of like, well, what, what on earth would we be useful for? I mean, you farm animals for food and and also yeah you farm animals for food and what we farm for maybe our ideas or are we a test for to see if trump gets elected again and then find out if it all goes tits up that's what the simulation will be like let's not do that let's not elect him or it's all these different possibilities there's a nice i quite like there's a story in like an italo calvino book where there's um so it's like invisible cities and there's a world where there's there's a tower and in the tower there's these globes and in the globes there are different versions of the city that once could have been and once was and through different turning points how it changed and the idea of if you have this power to run a simulation that does that which isn't probably too far off the um you'll be able to find out what possibilities you could get like just running a simulation faster or something. But then there's also loads of other things like uh, there's lots of chaos that you can't like simulate and stuff like that. Um, uh, so I quite like all this kind of thought processes behind that. And also it means that I can, like I'm not vegetarian, but I mean, I don't like cruelty to animals like most people don't, but if you think that if you're in a simulation, you're controlled by something else that you possibly wouldn't want to be treated badly. So, so it's kind of like moralistically say, oh, if something's more powerful than you, you'd want them to have some good ethics. So. It's quite interesting bringing the idea of, of a sort of moral or ethical code into the process of art making. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, like hopefully like these are these are like my thought process hopefully this kind of thing kind of comes across but it's it, it stimulates ideas and i've done in the manifestations one i did use um one of the pieces was this tall tower and it had like in the middle section of this tower i used instead because i don't like using um i wanted something that represented not representative, I hate using that word, but something that was uh, organic. And I, I decided to kind of use, it sounds a bit gross, but it was lambs and pigs hearts from a butcher. And then I dry, dried them out and you, I got this really nice, um, uh, like it seemed like a clear, well, like a really rich red, um, structure that I made with a and I put a light in it and it was at the that was at the center of this this tower structure that I made and it kind of lit up and this tower was quite self-conscious it had um it had like eight uh, in, uh ultrasound sensors around it so it knew where you were and then as you walked around it it projected an image of itself as you walked around it so it was kind of it was very it's not as good as like all the AI that tries to convince you that it's alive, but it's it knew in that you could quite easily think that it knew it knew where you were and it showed an image of itself or a version of itself with the invisible uh, UV. It, I projected, uh, I, I painted on each side as you walked around an invisible UV projection of a pyramid with different colors on it. So as you walked around, you're walking around 
an image of the pyramid around the side of this tower. And yeah, yeah, that's something else. So, <laughs> but yeah. Go on, Alex. Yeah, hi, hi, Matthew. Um, Matthew. I'm really interested in the, the uh, research things you've talked about, and uh, I've, I've done quite a bit of research, like there's things that you've talked about. But what I'm interested in, in, in terms of your practice, is that you're, you know, you've got a very tactile relationship with the work you're making. You talked about casting and drawing and and the, the, the touch of the rock and everything. And, and uh, I'm interested in that relationship between while you're, while you're contemplating, you know, other universes and AI and those kind of things, you, you, you're still maintaining this very, um, uh, you know, immediate response. And, you know, you, you've, you've got this very present experience with the work that you're making. And, and can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, about that sort of, that uh, relationship the work you're actually making yeah yeah i kind of I, I set certain rules uh with what i like my artistic moralistic roles the things that i do and don't do and like one of them is like how i mentioned with images and how i don't like to use them to tr to transfer you somewhere else other than the present mm. away from the work in front of you so uh, the, the the tactile side of it i think with to be honest, the, some of them are quite fragile, some of the works, because they've, they've got exposed um, electronics that aren't dangerous and not a with voltage, by the way. Um, but the, I wouldn't, I think the making the work with the, with it being tactile, I, I, I use so many different materials and I work as a fabricator anyway. And I, I quite like messing around and discovering things and playing around with things. And, and pushing like different ideas so um i think you the, i generally get controlled a little bit by the material and my ideas and right and wrong but i also try to leave a little bit free with i try not to so my drawings when i said that the draw i do all these drawings and i've got like loads of them and there's when i've got a bit of time and sat around and i'll draw these ideas and then I'll never do them because I just don't like the idea of being controlled like that. I've got too many constraints anyway. And if I was to be to do something straight from a drawing, it remind me of work, and it, I would always get it wrong or something. Not that I get work wrong all the time, but, <laughs> but it, it's like there is an answer there. And I think when I'm when I'm making stuff that I kind of carve bits away. And then I change it again. So I'm talking about a rock. Say so if I cut a bit away, I might then go back to it a few days later and go, oh, I didn't like that bit, or I like that bit, or and take more bits off. And then that's kind of how I kind of see our approach to our environment anyway. It's like we just hack it and we just change it. And we've got no idea what we're doing. So it's a little bit similar to that, I guess. That help? Yeah, it's just it's really interesting, isn't it? Just to get an understanding of how they how they come about, you know. Yeah, I like the work a lot. Thank you. Oh, yes, thanks. Um, I've got a little question. I mean, I, I was a little bit surprised that the um, the mark making on the objects wasn't um, uh, trying to elicit some form of. I mean, it feels quite recognisable. There's a kind of futuristic and historic element to it. Are they really just kind of, um, you know, in some way it looks a bit like circuit boards, in some way it looks like cave paintings or like uh, early drawing. Is that all kind of quite autonomous or um, do, you, do you see that language in there or not? Yeah, no, it's definitely like that. It's the circuit boards. Some of the drawings of the circuit boards have been directly taken from the circuit boards. Like, so the early ones, the circuit boards that my brother drew, some of the patterns painted on painted on the rocks in the UV was directly taken from that. And it's a way of just tying the object in itself, like, um, so that you don't, I'm not drawing something too much that's too far away from the work. So it's quite honest in the way that you see all the circuitry, you see the, you see the board, you can actually tell what it does by looking at the board if you knew what it all was. But the, it's all honest. And then the, the, the mark making on it, 
uh, to do with the work so that you're not thinking of something else too much. So the circuit, I did, I have done the angles on quite a lot of them are taken from circuitry and on the flat edges, they're very much linear. So it's kind of, that's the kind of rule that I've ended up with. And the rock side, it does seem very primitive in a way that it seems like the first drawing that you just do, you do some dots and you do some lines. It's very, very like the first pattern making. And then it changes to like really straight and rigorous lines. Um, I don't know, I don't know if you remember, did you remember did I had a tower exhibition ages ago? Where you stick your head in a tower? Uh, yeah, was that a center space? Yeah, yeah. So I think that was the first time, because I, I, I used to make really conceptual work when I didn't have much time at work. And then um, I got really fed up and left work. So I, I thought I'd need to make something. So I made this hanging tower. And in the bottom of the tower, there was, um, it was uh, like a rocky structure. And it looked like a plinth coming out the top of it. And you stuck your head inside. And on the inside of it, there was a sound made by Danny, uh, and um, it was like a mini, looked like a mini world in there. But at the bottom, it was very rustic. And you had all these kind of rustic objects. And as you go up, they started making little structures. And as you got to the top of the tower, there's these really refined boxes with refined circles on them. And it was kind of like this work that's very i find this an artwork you have work that's really refined and really clean and then you get work that you can tell someone's just gone out there and just made it and i i enjoy doing both of them i like really neat bits but i also like really kind of that someone that's just made something like just decided oh that's what's just come out their head and the contrast between them is really nice like the rough side of the rock and the, the smooth with the the kind of the dotty doodles with the uh, really straight lines and stuff. So the tower was an actual, it ended, I discovered this the other day after looking at it again, as it was a gradual uh, ascent to this kind of euphoric, uh, clean lines at the top, where it got very rigorous and boring when it's at its extreme. And at the bottom, it's really rough. And then in between, you might like that more and trying to find a balance with the work and finding where you prefer. And because it's kind of like, oh, one day you might walk in there and you might find you might have a busy day at work and you come home and you see a piece of work that's really clean and really nice and neat. And you might really like that. I was asking my brother, some of his scientists really enjoy really boring, abstract, minimal work where you ask artists and they, they're like, oh, I love this expressive chaotic mess and it's because you spend you kind of like it's what what you prefer after you've had a hard day's pick on your brain about something i guess you might want something a bit minimal i don't know something like that <laughs> hey thank you i i think if uh, nobody else has got any more questions um just wanted to share um share your oh i've lost it where have i put it the your exhibition hang on a minute um oh i can't find it. hang on <laughs> just explain it matt for a oh, minute I know. Find it. so i think it's the we've got um an exhibition at cos art contemporary which is um i think it's the sixth this is why i was trying to get the poster for it it's the sixth to the eighth and it's on till I'm going to get this wrong. Six till no, it's not six. Nine. Twelve can, till eight. Can you um? Can you jump in here? Oh, would be said. She'll be really good at this. Hello, first of all, <laughs> thank you so much. It's been great listening to you. I have to say that your exhibition was one of my favorite exhibitions to put on at Corsa. And yes, there it is. Um, so it's sixth, seventh, and eighth um, November. 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, booking is absolutely essential just because of it, the times we're living in. And um, yeah, and it will be the last exhibition in this space. And I'm really grateful for all the participating artists, especially 
all the ones that I've worked with before as well. Very recently, Jessica Yu and Matt Yu as well, and other people as well here. Yeah, you got the times right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, B. Right, cheers. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's happening. So that's opening next Friday then. Yeah. <laughs> Better go <and> work now. <laughs> which is very exciting to be able to have so many different um oh sorry i can't say anything it's super bright, feel, everyone's yeah. <laughs> um so yeah all seeing so many exhibitions on at the moment in bristol has been incredibly inspiring and i kind of urge everyone to go down to that because i guess we don't know how long we're going to be able to go and see things and there are i think i'm right in saying there are 25 different artists showing work in this in this exhibition um and are they all um are they all sculptural be or are they painting and performance as well uh, multidisciplinary so painters sculptors um different works it'll be quite exciting come and see it excellent thank you and thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, uh, Matt. That was really interesting. Yeah. And um, we will be putting the talk online in the coming weeks. Next week, we are uh, hosting Ellie Shipman, and she's going to be talking about her um, participatory practice. So um, no need to book via Eventbrite. I've just put the Zoom link on our um, artist talk page on our website. Um, so if you, you can just join via that at one, one o'clock next week. Thanks very much. Yes. Bye. Thanks, Matt.